Girls in Pants are just quite a lot in its first episode as it sets up both the show's premise, several of our main characters, and gets the plot in motion. One of these things, which may fly under the radar amid everything else going on, is the introduction of Ori's student council. It's brilliantly done, and it demonstrates that the show's writers and the entire creative team know their audience extremely well, meaning they both know what the audience expects and what they want, but more importantly, they know how to play on these expectations in a clever, satisfying way. Like I may have mentioned in my last video, this creative team put great thought and care into every detail of the show, including each aspect of the student council's introduction here, which includes them pulling a bit of a fast one on first-time viewers. Also, before I go further, note that there will be some spoilers for the show here. While Girls from Panzer first came out a decade ago now, almost exactly in fact, this show is so good that you'd be doing yourself a disservice if you didn't go into it as cold as possible, especially in regard to some of what I'm going to talk about. People who are unfamiliar with Girls in Panzer, but have watched a good deal of other anime, are going to be well versed in some tropes that are frequently found. The two relevant ones for this discussion are that of the student council being either evil or just abusing its power, and the ever-present evil glasses trope, you know the one with the creepy glowing lenses. Of course, these tropes aren't necessarily overdone, and the glowing glasses trope isn't exclusively used for nefarious characters. That is the case often enough that the viewer, seeing how the student council acts here initially, makes certain assumptions. But let's get into the episode proper before going into how the show plays with your expectations a bit. Having just spent a fair amount of time establishing Miho as a character, including both her shy, nervous disposition and her extreme aversion, for currently unknown reasons, to Senshido as she makes friends and settles in, it's time to upend that and get the proverbial tank rolling. Here is where the student council is introduced, and pretty much every single shot of them is set up to make them look as intimidating as possible. Well, except maybe for Yuzu, since she's too much of a cinnamon roll to look intimidating even if she tried. The student council is shown shrouded in shadow, in front of a large, ominously bright screen, and in many other shots they're viewed from a low angle that makes them look bigger and more intimidating than they really are, especially in Anzu's case. Unsurprisingly, the student council's actions in this episode also lend an unsuspecting viewer and Miho, Sayori, and Hana to think that they're up to no good. They speak in vague terms about some plan they have, and they're pushing Senshido really hard. Finally, this all culminates in their bullying of Miho into doing Senshido despite her wishes. Of course, once we learn more about the student council as the season progresses, it's very clear that they were never going to actually punish Miho for saying no, but they were desperate enough to intimate that to her also, based on how they worded their threat, they may have just been sneakily referring to the school permanently closing, since if the school closed, she wouldn't be there long. But in episode 1, we don't know any of that, and neither does Miho. All we know is that they're pressuring her into doing something she really does not want to do. As I mentioned earlier, the creative team, knowing that their viewers are anime fans who are familiar with both the abuse of student council and evil glasses trope, utilize these to make us think that things are going one way, when they're in fact going a very different direction. This is a clever move by the writers for another reason as well. Girls on Panzer is an interesting show in that it doesn't really have a villain for most of its run. We only get introduced to the real villain of the show, this asshole, much later on. Also, it's worth noting here that with the introduction of this character, the creators make it very clear to the viewer that they understand the evil glasses trope that they play with at the start. But you need to have at least some tension even before the main conflict is revealed, so we briefly have the other girls set up in antagonistic roles. The biggest ones, obviously, are the Kuromori Mina girls, Maho and Erika, but Katyusha is also initially portrayed in an antagonistic manner, and at the start here, that task falls to the student council. But, with the writers being as good as they are, there are enough hints for eagle-eyed viewers to pick up on the fact that things are not quite what they seem. And, of course, us diehard fans get to appreciate all of this upon rewatch. First off, there's this comedy gold shot we get when we receive our first full view of the trio. Honestly, Whoever came up with this deserves an award. It's hilarious without anything needing to be said, and it's a perfect introduction to Anzu Kadotani, the president and arguably the biggest chad in the series, who will probably end up ruling Japan someday in this universe. But let's not get sidetracked. She'll probably need her own character spotlight video at some point anyway. So this scene is a very subtle bit of comedy that produces our first hint that the student council isn't quite as threatening as they might seem, but while also not completely deflating the tension that Miho is facing here. Some of their lines throughout the episode, too, provide little hints of how desperate they feel despite their intimidating facade, like this one. 
In the business, we call this foreshadowing. These things culminate in their visual relief when Miho finally agrees to join the Senshido team. While they don't show it, well, not much anyway, they were likely as nervous as Miho was here. Without her, Orai has no chance of winning, and they all knew it. Well, at least Momo and Yuzu were worried. Anju's the girl with the plan, and she's in charge for a reason. It also goes without saying that Anju in particular is obscenely likable and charismatic. She's a character you naturally don't want to be cast as a villain, despite her seeming to be cast as a bully initially, since she just steals every scene she's in, and she almost comes off as aggressively friendly more than intimidating. Have I made it clear yet that I really like this character? But again, let's not get sidetracked. Over the next several episodes, as we see more of the council in action, and as they interact more with Miho in less tense moments, the truth becomes clear that, just like all the other girls in this show, they're genuinely nice people who are just trying to do their best, and not at all the overbearing bullies they might have appeared to be at first glance. The main turning point, in my opinion, is when, after losing the practice match to St. Gloriana in episode 4, Anzu decides that, in regard to the bet that they made that Miho would need to perform the embarrassing anglerfish dance if they lost, since it was the council that put Miho up to this, and since they didn't perform particularly well in the match, it was only right that they suffer alongside her, demonstrating that by this point, they're comrades at arms, if they weren't already. Though I guess it's also possible that Anzu just wanted to do the dance herself, since she looks to be the only one enjoying herself when they perform it. But it all starts with that introduction to the student council, and leading us along a bit, both helps up the tension as we wait to get back to the tanks, and makes the viewer wonder what exactly is going on. Since we don't get another proper tank battle till episode 4, these scenes in episode 1 are very important to keep the viewers engaged until then. Throughout the show's run, and into Dare Film and Das Finale, the creative team continues to demonstrate not just an extreme attention to detail, but also a keen understanding of and respect for their target audience, both in regard to what they expect and what will satisfy them. There's plenty more to talk about, so look forward to many more videos on this wonderful show. If you like what I do here and would like to support the channel, then check out my books and light novels over on Amazon. I'm currently taking part in a Black Friday sale, so the first books in both of my main series are in stuff for 99 cents. Also check out my Patreon, where I share first looks at both upcoming videos and updates on my writing projects with my supporters. Links are in the description below. There's a lot more cool stuff coming soon on the writing front, in addition to the videos, so make sure you don't miss it. Until next time.